Good day, everyone. Today we're going to go over thermochemistry. <clears throat> so, uh, what's on the agenda for the day? First is uh, the first law of thermodynamics. So, uh, where energy transfers to and from. Uh, second is going to be the change in internal energy. So, whether uh, you know you have heat input or heat output, as well as work input or work output, what the net change in internal energy is going to be. The third is going to be enthalpy and uh, endothermic and ex exothermic processes. So whether uh, something needs to absorb um, heat energy in order to go forward or uh, give it off. <clears throat> um, calorimetry, so the study of breaking down uh, particular components with the use of oxygen uh, and seeing how much energy is released upon that uh, breakdown. Fifth is Hess's law of summation. So it's basically taking the sum of all of the uh, different enthalpies of reaction uh, um, or heat of formation for each particular um, component or for each particular component in um, an unknown. And then finally, uh, looking at the standard enthalpy of formation at 25 degrees C in one atmosphere. So uh, essentially standard conditions. Um, okay, so those are all going to be in amounts for standard conditions, and we'll get into that in the end. Uh, first thing we're going to cover is uh, first law of thermodynamics. So <clears throat> the universe, or at least the uh, energy of the universe, is equal to the system plus its surroundings. So no energy can be created or destroyed, um, always conserved, right? So either one thing is giving it off, one thing sponging it up. Okay, so uh, thus the uh, change in internal or of energy in the uh, universe is essentially zero. Zero kilojoules, zero joules, no matter how fine or uh, coarse you want to look at it. Okay, so um, energy is transferred from surroundings to system and vice versa. <clears throat> so uh, let's start with work energy. So work is simply a force, so that... Uh, being mass times the acceleration. So uh, acceleration is expressed in meters per second squared. Okay, uh, times distance. So delta x means the change in, you know, going from uh, one position to another, uh, assuming just one dimension. Okay, and then um, the energy itself is going to be equal to um, the work energy, rather, is going to be equal to the mass times the acceleration times the distance traveled. So your base units that you're going to see for that is going to be, uh, they're going to be uh, kilodrew, sorry, kilograms, uh, which is going to represent your mass, meters, which is going to represent your distance, um, you know, displaced. Then your uh, meters per second squared is going to be your acceleration. Okay, so... Uh, these are essentially base units for any type of energy, whether you think of kinetic energy or potential energy. Okay. Um, sorry about that being cropped out, but uh, nonetheless, let's move forward. Let's talk about um, the change in energy and in an in internal energy in a system. So problem seven, or sorry, 9.26 on page 423. Calculate delta E for a system that absorbs 726 kilojoules of heat. So heat is denoted by Q, little q, from its surroundings, from its surroundings. So pay attention and parse out the verbiage here. Uh, and does, does, or in other words, performs 526 um kilojoules of work on its surroundings okay so why don't you take a minute or two to go over that and then um we'll figure out what the answer is so uh think about plus or minus signs for work plus or minus signs for heat so pause okay so for this particular example um the change in internal energy is simply going to be the sum of the heat energy plus the work so if it's positive in sign, that means that, at least for this particular context for heat, that means that 726 joules of, kilojoules of heat is added, uh, absorbs, right? So in other words, 
if it's absorbed in the system, that means it's going to be positive. Um, and if that, in turn, does 526 kilojoules of work on the surroundings, that means that work is going to be negative on the system. So in other words, it's doing work on the surroundings. Surroundings would be positive 526. Work on the uh, system would be negative 526. Okay, so again, net sum of zero. All right, so uh, to sum these two uh, values together, this is going to be negative 526 plus uh, 726 to give you a net positive 200 uh, kilojoules. Okay, so let's think of pressure volume work. Okay, so um, <clears throat> see figure 9.10 on page 379. So a piston compresses a hydrocarbon gas and then the volume is expanded by the release of energy. So it's sort of like a bang, if you will. So um, a lot of that heat is getting driven off as well as, um, you know, that, that expansion. Okay, so for compression delta V or the change in volume is going to be negative in sign, right? So you're going from, let's say, full volume to half volume. Remember, you're going... To to final minus initial. Okay, so vice versa for the expansion. So you're going from half volume to full volume or double the volume. Okay, so that's going to be positive in sign. Okay, so um, what does that mean in terms of the context of enthalpy? Well, enthalpy um, is a separate sort of uh, quantity of energy, if you will, related to uh, what's going on with the internal energy and then that change in pressure or volume, okay? So uh, when a reaction occurs, a change takes place. Either energy is let off or is absorbed. Well, how? Okay, so it's usually through a matter of heat transfer. Okay, so enthalpy or delta H is going to be equal to the change in internal energy of a system plus the change in P times V. So that means the product of pressure and volume. Okay, so uh, the essence of the change in enthalpy is either a heat product, so that means uh, delta H is negative, so that means heat is getting kicked out as a byproduct, essentially, or a heat reactant. So in other words, uh, delta H is going to be positive and it's going to sponge up some kind of energy from its surroundings. So you can think of something that's cold to the touch being um, delta H positive or endothermic. So that means that's trying to drive the, um, the heat energy into the system. Whereas with a heat product, um, you'll see that heat is going to be driven off. So it's going to be hot to the touch or exothermic. So... Um, so what, I mean, if you, if you, if you're thinking about, well, if these things are, you know, kind of going in reverse, well, yeah, they can go in reverse and <clears throat> you're going to get, um, an equal magnitude going in the opposite direction. So for instance, here we have two equivalents of H2, one equivalent of O2 gas to sum up to, um, create two equivalents of H2O in the liquid form. Okay, so that delta H is going to be uh, highly exothermic. So it means negative 571 kilojoules of energy is given off per equivalent. Okay, and then um, on the reverse end of things, if you flip that around and you go from two uh, equivalents of H2O liquid to two equivalents of H2 gas and O2 gas, um, that's going to be a highly endothermic reaction, meaning it's going to require a lot of heat from an external source. Okay. okay, so the next thing we're going to apply this to, since we're talking about chemistry here, is um, applying it to stoichiometry. So if we're thinking about equivalents, um, you know, each equivalent or coefficient is factored into the thermochemical equation. Um, so you have to refer to specific amounts that are given and then kind of work with your empirical formula that's, let's say, right here in a thermochemical equation. 
All right, so um, say you have 7.2 moles of H2 and then you have 4.7 moles of O2 to form water. What is the change in enthalpy for the reaction given the amounts of reactants? Okay, so notice how things aren't exactly proportional in terms of what you see empirically. So that means you have to figure out what the... Um, the uh, limiting reactant is going to be, okay? So two equivalents of H2 um, to yield two equivalents of H2O is going to give you negative 571.6. Uh, one equivalent of O2 is going to give you the same amount. So if we actually calculate out um, what kind of um, amounts of water we're going to drive out here, 7.2 uh, moles of H2. So there's a two to two or one to one essentially relationship between H2 and H2O gas. So it's going to give you 7.2 moles of H2O yielded. Okay. And then uh, when you take the 4.7 moles of O2, remember there are two or two moles of H2O to one mole of O2. So that conversion is going to give you or yield 9.4 moles of H2O if you had enough of H2 to have worked out with. So in other words, um, O2 is going to be in excess and um, H2 is going to be limiting. So 7.2 moles of H2O yielded. Okay. So um, then all we have to do now is take that 7.2 moles of H2 and plug in what we have for our um, coefficient here as well as the mole count, which is proportional. And then uh, put in your delta H value on the top. So essentially your moles are going to cancel out and then you're just going to be left with uh, 2.1 times 10 to the 3 kilojoules negative. So be sure that this particular sign carries over. Okay. So if you have a sign that's off, that means it's going to be wrong. All right. Uh, let's take a look at heat of fusion slash vaporization. So in other words, this is a amount of energy required to change states, if you will. So these are not... Um, chemical processes that are more physical processes. So um, how much energy is required to boil 800 or sorry 87.3 grams of ethanol. So the molecular weight of ethanol is 46.07 grams per mole. The delta uh, H of vaporization is plus 38.6 kilojoules per mole. So in other words that's going to be kind of an uphill battle. In other words it needs some kind of external um, heat energy in order to get that to vaporize right at a at um let's say a, you know one atmosphere okay so let's do some conversions here think about what um what kind of conversion factor you're going to need to convert that to moles because that's what's here on the uh, <clears throat> denominator of your units for delta h of vaporization so in other words it's proportional to the amount that you have all right, so why don't you figure out how much is required, pause, and we will get back with the answer. Okay, so I took 87.3 uh, grams of ethanol, converted that to moles using the molecular weight, <clears throat> and then I immediately just plugged that in uh, with the actual conversion to uh, delta H of vaporization. So one mole of ethanol, again, per mole, so in other words, those moles of ethanol cancel out and you're just left with kilojoules uh, for your units. So in total, you're going to get plus 73.1 kilojoules required to uh, make that 87.3 grams of. Okay, so things here are going to get a little bit messy, but I'm going to try to uh, make this as concise and as uh, logical as possible. Okay, so there are two different types of molar or specific heat capacities. And essentially, uh, this is how much energy is required to change uh, temperature, you know, per degree C, how much kilojoules or what have you. Um, you know, sometimes you'll uh, look at, let's say, if you're getting a grill or you're getting something that uh, uses heat to cook food or what have you, you know, um, You'll see BTUs or something like that. Those aren't necessarily uh, SI units, but um, you can do some kind of conversion in terms of 
you know, uh, how much energy or heat output you would get from that particular grill or, or, you know, element, whatever you want to call it. Okay. So let's give the analogy of, let's say, uh, taking a hot poker that you would stoke a fire with and you keep it in the fire for a little while and you kind of forget about it for a little bit. And then you bring it up to a bucket of room temperature water and you stick it in there. What's going to happen? You're going to see a bunch of steam come off, right? It's going to roll off and um, cause a big hiss, right? So transfer of heat energy. <clears throat> so in other words, that heat energy that was once um, kind of embedded, if you will, into the uh, the um, poker, right? The metal poker of some kind. You stick it right into that water and that water is going to immediately, without affecting the poker, um, you know, kind of boil off or fizz off or... Um, what have you, you're going to see some kind of steam or, you know, come off. So in other words, there's a transfer of heat energy. The heat moves, the cold doesn't, right? So the cold from the water doesn't get sponged up into the poker. What happens is the heat energy from the poker transfers over to the water. So it's kind of a misconception that some people have. Think also of an AC unit. So you, you could feel that the, the cold air is getting blown on you, but that cold air is absorbing heat energy from the matter surrounding it. So that means, you know, all the gaseous molecules that are cool in, in your home or, what ha or warm in your home are getting cooled off. Okay, so that heat transfer is actually going towards that cold air. All right. And, of course, making everything cooler. So let's look at a particular example of specific heat. Um, it's quite a lengthy one, and um, <clears throat> we'll kind of break it down piece by piece here. Uh, so take a look at problem 9.55 on page uh, 425. So exactly 10 mL of water at 25 degrees C is added to a hot iron skillet, so iron's Fe. All the water is converted to um, H2O gas at 100 degrees C. The mass of the skillet is 1.20 kilograms. What is the change in temperature of the skillet? Okay, so what you want to think of before you get started on this problem, uh, before you pause, is think of the amount of heat that is transferring from the skillet to the water the amount of heat that is driving the water off, right? So if it uh, boiled off, right? So if all of it, so if all of it has gone from 10 mLs of water in the liquid state at 25 degrees to 70, uh, sorry, to um, 100 degrees C, that's a net change of 75 degrees C. So um, think about how much energy goes into that. Take a look at the table. Uh, in your text in chapter 9, and that should be able to kind of guide you, steer you in the right path. Okay, so um, the Q, or um, heat energy, that goes into H2O is the negative Q, or the skillet um, heat energy lost. Okay, so Q is equal to H2, or Q sub H2O is equal to N, meaning the uh, number of moles, times the molar heat capacity, because you want molar heat capacity instead of specific heat capacity. And then uh, the change in temperature. Okay, so for water, it's going from 100 degree, uh, from 25 degrees C to 100 degrees C. So that net change is 75 degrees C. Okay, and then uh, that actual water that also goes up into the vapor phase, you have to take that molar amount, which is going to be all of it, 10 mLs, assume it's 1 mL or 1 gram per mL for water, and then multiplying out that delta H uh, of vaporization. So that's going to be equal to um, the Q of your skillet, okay? But we want to see exactly how much that skillet has dropped in temperature, Right, so we don't really have um, any kind of quantity for um, or measurement of how hot that skillet is. Well, all we know is that it's 
well above 100 degrees C. Okay, so if we were to plug everything in to these particular terms that you see here, we take 10 grams uh, and convert that into moles using 18.04 grams uh, per mole of water, okay? Uh, then we just take the molar heat capacity. Notice, notice how it's expressed in joules per mole degree C. So degree C is going to cancel out, moles is going to cancel out, and then you're just going to be left with joules. You want some kind of energy quantity, right, left over. So then you can back calculate using CP or uh, the molar heat capacity of um, iron that that's supposed to be fe right there sorry if you can't see that very well okay and um we know that you know 1.20 kilograms of um iron is going to comprise x number of moles of um you know what comprises that pan or amounts okay so um this particular term is going to be 3,135.37.5 uh, joules plus 22,561 joules on this term. Okay, so in other words, uh, <clears throat> you know, all of that energy that was required to get it to boil was this. All of the, all of the energy that was required to vaporize was this okay so the delta the what's going to give that away is the change in uh temperature okay so this is required to boil the whole 10 grams off now we're just kind of uh ignoring any type of vapor pressure at the lower temperatures okay we're just trying to get um, an approximation of what kind of um, energy was transferred here Okay, so in sum, that's going to be 25,697, uh, uh, joules. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to plug that into Q on the top. Again, if we're solving for T, all we have to do is take the Q of the skillet and, um, you know, divide that by the number of moles of iron as well as the specific, or sorry, the uh, uh, molar heat capacity. Okay, so for the molar heat capacity of uh, iron, look how much higher it is than water. So it's 541 joules uh, per degree C. That makes sense because, you know, if it's much higher, that means it's going to be much harder to, let's say, melt from being a solid or, let's say, even further going to, um, you know, the gas phase of iron, which is must be insanely hot. Okay, so um, we plug in that. Uh, Q value of water on the top, divide it by our um, change in, I'm sorry, this whole, um, I kind of jumped ahead on myself here. This is actually the molar heat capacity. I'm sorry, this is uh, a little bit lower, meaning that it takes actually less energy to get things to move a certain degree, that doesn't mean that it's actually changing the uh, the state of the particular iron skillet. I'm very sorry, that was much a scratch on my part. Okay, so let's look back at uh, getting our Q of the skillet, at least from uh, the terms of what we're given here. So we have 1.2 times 10 to the three grams, um, and then we're going to convert that using the atomic weight of iron. And then we're also going to use the specific heat, or sorry, the molar heat capacity of uh, iron to get that particular quantity. And that is um, everything other than delta T. Okay, so in other words, when we plug in Q of H2O, divide that by everything here less the actual change in temperature that's going to give us uh, the change in temperature for our iron. Okay, so plugging 25,698 joules on the top, and we have joules on the bottom, so those cancel out, 541 kilo, uh, joules, sorry. And then um, 
denominator degree C is going to flip up over, and that's going to be negative 47.5 degrees C. Okay, so for the calorimetry example, <clears throat> Uh, this is going to be a combustion product what we're going to look at here. So uh, problem 9.66 on page 425. Uh, combustion of one mole of anethol, uh, which is sort of a synthetic um, or um, I guess a naturally extracted compound. It's what you definitely smell with, let's say, licorice. I spilled some of that in an office that I was using at Union, and it reeked forever. It took forever to get out of, um, we'll get the smell out of there. Okay, so combustion produces uh, 5,541 kilojoules of thermal energy. Okay, so if 0 0.950 grams of anethol is combusted in a bomb calorimeter, uh, so a bomb calorimeter is basically this big metal um, cylinder, if you will, it keeps a closed system and you basically heat things up to a particular um, amount and then based on uh, the energy that is absorbed into the calorimeter, um, you can deduce how much um, calories, in other words, the same kind of calories you would burn, um, you know, doing an exercise or reading a book or whatever, okay? Um, all that's converted in, into actual specific amounts or, let's say, quantities in this case. Okay, so uh, the heat capacity is 7.854 kilojoules. So what is the delta T of the calorimeter? Okay, so let's look at the molecular weight itself. That's 148.2 grams per mole. Um, the mass of anethol or sorry, the moles of anethol, I can barely read that, is uh, 0.950 grams. So converting that to moles, that's going to be 6.41 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of anethol. Okay, um, so the change in internal an energy from anethol, that's going to be 6.41 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And converting that uh, from that combustion product uh, energy. So 5,541 joules per mole of anethol. That's going to give you 35.5 <clears throat> kilojoules. Okay, so this is a small number multiplying a larger number to give you, you know, a modest number of positive. Okay, so um, if the heat capacity is 7.54 kilojoules per mole per uh sorry kilojoules per degree c and we divide that particular energy amount <clears throat> um then we're going to get 4.52 degrees c as a change so you know not crazy change but um enough to be significant where you might notice a difference okay so now we're going to look back at enthalpy and look at Hess's law of summation. So how does one determine the enthalpy of a particular reaction without the data? So in other words, if this hasn't been standardized and cataloged by NIST or someone, how are we going to figure out, um, you know, getting, let's say, two products um, and, you know, sorry, two reactants to react out and generate one product or more products? Well... Um, if we actually know how to form those reactants or products from different species and have them all be sort of common in terms of uh, multiple thermochemical equations, we can cancel them out and figure out approximately um, what those formation energies are, are. okay? Okay, so let's take uh, like thermochemical reactants and products and their known data. Combine and sum up the correct enthalpy of each step. Okay, so let's look at uh, problem 9.71, or sorry, 9.74 in your text on page 426. So pause and give a few minutes. Try to just line up the, um, the thermochemical equations and see what you can come up with for the net 
chemical equation, thermochemical equation, which is going to be what's here in red. So uh, carbon as a diamond, solid as a diamond, of course, to uh, carbon that's solid as graphite. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to figure Okay, so um, what I have here in blue is what is given to you in your text. I've already gone over this because um, I already did this video and it erased on me. So here we are again. I'm not rewriting it. I have way too much to do. So let's go with the blue. That's what you have in your text and what I've manipulated. Okay, so the only actual thermochemical equation that I've manipulated here is reversing this particular uh, second equation. So two equivalents of carbon monoxide gas reacting with one equivalent of O2 gas to yield two equivalents of CO2. Okay, so if we flip it around, remember that we're going to be flipping the delta H sign. It's going to be same in terms of magnitude, but it's going to be opposite in sign. Okay, so when we flip everything over, that means reactants go to uh, products and products go to reactants. Okay, so why do we do this? Well, we want to cancel out all of our intermediates to where we just have our reactant and our product in this case as it is. Okay, so <clears throat> we have diamond on the left side on uh, the first thermochemical equation, which is exactly what we want. Um, O2 is not expressed, so we'll leave that there and hope to find something on the um, product side later. So it's sort of uh, the same way you think of spectator ions. If they appear there on the reactant side, and if they appear on the product side, you can pretty much just cancel them out. They're not part of the net equation or the net reaction, if you will. Okay, so now I wrote um, the... A manipulated equation in red so everything flipped over that o2 is right there on the reactant or uh, sorry on the product side now that o2 uh is scratched out as you can see i put that red sort of dashed across each one so reactants products scratched out one two equivalents of co2 on the reactant side only one on this side but notice how on the third equation, which we're not going to manipulate, that is going to be, uh, that has one equivalent of CO2 gas that is formed as well as a product. So in other words, these two sum up to be two equivalents of CO2, and that's going to cancel out between those two equivalents of CO2. Okay, uh, so to wrap this up, <clears throat> two equivalents of CO gas on the reactant side, so two equivalents of carbon monoxide. It's going to be canceled out with a manipulated second thermochemical equation with two equivalents of CO gas on the product side. Okay, so when those two cancel out, all you're left with is um, solid carbon in the diamond form to solid carbon in the graphite form, and everything else is basically dusted off. So uh, what do we do? All we really have to do is now sum up all of these thermochemical data okay so we take negative 395.4 kilojoules add that to positive 566 kilojoules add that to negative 172.5 kilojoules that net sum is going to be negative 1.9 kilojoules so a lot of work for meager rewards you'll get a whole big dose of that next semester so get used to it okay uh your turn now <clears throat> so uh, take a look at this particular equation just without just ignore the red for right now um see what the actual sum up is just do work out all the uh thermochemical equations here and um, see what you come up with for this net ion, or sorry, this net equation here, which is C2H4 plus H2 gas is going to give you C2H6. So it's, this is what is referred to as a hydrogenation reaction. So give that a couple. All right. <clears throat> so um, as you can see here, the first thermochemical equation doesn't need to be manipulated. The second one is going to need to because we need to have. Um, 
this on the product side. All right. So when we flip everything over, that C2H6 is on the product side. That O2 is there on the product side or seven halves. Okay. And then three equivalents of H2O and uh, two equivalents of CO2 on the reactant side. Okay. So that's something to take note of. Again, that delta H uh, sign is going to flip, so it's going to be positive 1560 from the negative 1560 from the original. All right, and then uh, the last thermochemical equation doesn't get manipulated either. It's just uh, H2 gas plus one half of O2 gas to give you uh, one equivalent of H2O in the liquid phase. So um, notice how O2, H2O, um, CO2, none of those are actually part of the net um, overall equation that we're looking to solve for. But if they're all intermediates in these in this three-step sequence, we can pretty much scratch them out if they're reactants and products on opposite end, and they all um, you know kind of line up in terms of equivalence here. So um, seven halves is really what three and a half, right? So three of those equivalents get scratched out. Another half gets scratched out here. So there goes O2. <clears throat> two equivalents of CO2 on the reactant side. Two equivalents on the product side. Goodbye to CO2. Three equivalents of water here. Two equivalents of water on the product on the, on the first thermochemical cool, cool. <laughs> thermochemical equation. I actually skipped on myself. And then one equivalent of water over here, so that all cancels out. Okay, so now we're just left with C2H4, H2 gas, and then our product, which is C2H6 right here in the red font. So, um, summing everything up, negative 14, 11 kilojoules, plus uh, positive 1560 kilojoules plus negative 286 kilojoules is going to give you negative uh, 137 kilojoules for this process. So in other words, um, this hydrogenation is going to drive heat off. Okay, last thing to go over with uh, you for the chapter, chapter 9, uh, standard enthalpy of formation. So standard's really the uh, term to look for here, meaning 25 degrees C, one atmosphere. <clears throat> so this is always going to be in terms of kilojoules per mole. Okay, so there's always going to be um, a fixed amount of energy in order to break or make a bond per mole. Okay, so in other words, all these thermochemical data that you see here, you can all find in the back of your text in uh, the appendix. I think it's appendix four. Okay, so if we <clears throat> look at it's the difference of energy of bonds formed from reactants, uh, bonds broken at standard conditions. So in other words, if we're really looking to do... Um, the delta H of formation for the whole reaction, you're going to have the sum of the delta H of products. But remember that the coefficient here, or coefficient that's going to be in front of each of these species, is going to be a multiplicative factor. So in other words, for instance, with water here, we have uh, negative 241.8 kilojoules per mole, we would double that because there's a two in front of there for the um, balance reaction. So I balanced it for you because again, uh, you know the apps I've been using have been so great and reliable. Okay, so <clears throat> um, and then we have positive 82.1 kilojoules doesn't have any coefficients, so we leave it as is. Okay, so. If we're looking, the, those are what I just mentioned are the products. So summing those two particular quantities up together, um, two times negative two forty one point eight kilojoules per mole. So it's going to give you a higher negative value, somewhere close to five hundred. And then you sum that up with positive eighty two point one kilojoules per mole. <clears throat> 
And then there's no coefficient here in front of ammonium nitrate. So in other words, uh, that's just going to be left as it is. So, <clears throat> um, and this is a negative sign here. This should be a negative sign here. Okay, so we do the math. It doesn't appear that I did it correct the first time. Okay, we have two times 241.8. That's going to be 483.6. We're going to make that a negative. Plus 82.1. So this particular term is going to be negative 401.5 kilojoules per mole. Per mole is important. Okay, so if we're uh, subtracting here and we have uh, negative 365.6 kilojoules per mole <clears throat> and you subtract that, again, that's just the one reactant that's there. Also, pay attention when you're looking at the uh, appendix. Be sure to pay attention to the state. Sort of like paying attention to the uh, sign, which apparently I did not do. So let's look at... Oh, also pay attention to make sure this is in appendix A4, table A4.3. Uh, be sure to get delta H of formation, not delta or S or delta G. But the states are specific. So if we look at ammonium nitrate, that should be in the inorganic compounds. So let me just track that down right quick. Yeah, NH4NO3 is going to be negative 365.6. Okay, so I got that right. Lucky me. Okay, so, but just remember, this is going to be negative. So, in other words, cross that out. Negative 401.5 kilojoules per mole minus negative uh, 365.6. So, okay, so that total should be negative. 35.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that should be the final answer. Okay, uh, why don't you guys give a shot uh, on problem 9.90 on the same page, and um, that'll be your little homework exercise, and we can go over that during the review. Everybody have a good one, stay safe, and uh, talk to you next.